Good day, students. Professor Pontificate here. Your course instructor, Professor Matt, asked that I come speak to you today about the silent era of filmmaking. Such a kind man, his request I could not deny. When you were a young whippersnapper, I'm sure your mother gently admonished you, much as mine did, to never stare directly at the sun. And the rebellious young pups you were, what did you do? Well, of course, you stared directly at the sun. Then when you turned away in horror, realizing too late your mother's wisdom, and closed your eyes in contemplation of your searing pain, what did you see? The lingering effects of the sun's light can be explained by a phenomenon known as the persistence of vision. The persistence of vision is one theory proffered for why humans see movies as continuous motion, when in actuality what we're watching are still photography projected at a rate of 24 frames per second which due no doubt to some wonderful flaw in our optical apparatus gives us the illusion of continuous motion. The prehistory of film begins with devices such as the magic lantern which worked like a slideshow that operated on the persistence of vision. Such toys were built concurrently in the United States, in France, England, and in Germany. Edward Maybridge, a British photographer, is a key figure in the transition from still to moving photography. He invented a device called the zoopraxiscope, which, like the magic lantern, was capable of projecting moving images. As the story goes, the genesis of moving pictures originated from a desire to settle a gambling bet. The bet was whether or not all four legs of a horse left the ground while the horse was at full run. Maybridge used a 12-camera setup to record the horse at various intervals of its run which proved, in fact, that yes, all four legs of the horse do leave the ground at the same time during its run. But Maybridge didn't just use the first moving pictures for the purposes of gambling. He also used the magic of moving pictures to photograph women in motion. On the other side of the ocean, Thomas Edison was busy creating the strip kintograph, a device that was capable of capturing moving images for about 15 to 90 seconds. Edison's invention, the kintoscope, allowed the images to be viewed. Edison's public debut of his kintoscope occurred in New York City in April of 1894, and the original film program proved movies were more than just about horses and models. Movies could boast such exciting subjects as blacksmiths at work, an employee sneezing, women dancing, strong men flexing their muscles, which reminds me I need to go to the gym. Edison also filmed animal tricks, spectacles like buildings being demolished, and other newsworthy events. Edison made quite a scandalous film called The Kiss, which featured May Irwin and John Rice performing the final image of the musical comedy The Widow Jones. Conservative organizations were anxious about the impact such images could have on an impressionable public, consisting of immigrants and children, and thus banded together to bring censorship to the movies as early as 1896. Edison shot his movies in what is usually considered the first movie studio, dubbed the Black Maria, so named because of the tar paper that covered the windows, making the small venue ghastly humid and a most unpleasant affair. Edison's next invention, his Vitascope, constituted the first film projected and debuted in April 23, 1896, on Broadway in New York City. This date marks the first exhibition of projected moving images in the United States. Edison was not only a brilliant inventor, but he was also the consummate capitalist. In 1908, he established the Motion Picture Patent Company, a trust that comprised Edison and nine of his com competitors who banded together to create a cartel that would monopolize the film industry by controlling production and distribution of movies in the United States. The Motion Picture Patents Company also struck a deal with Kodak to control the sale of film stock. Eventually, Edison's cartel was brought down by independents like Carl Lemley, Adolf Zucker, and William Fox, who would later create their own cartel. The independents were the first to produce multiple real films, to which the public responded favorably. And also significant was a court case, the Motion Picture Patents Company versus Lemley's Company, the Independent Moving Pictures Company, in which the courts ruled that IMP's camera did not infringe on Edison's patent. The court case opened the gates for independence and weakened Edison's trust. 
In France, the Lumière brothers were working simultaneously with Edison. The brothers Lumière were the first to standardize the 35 millimeter film and were known for their actualities, which might be roughly translated as documentary subjects, though today we might more aptly call them home movies. Some of the Lumiere brothers' most famous movies include Workers Leaving the Factory, Baby's First Meal, perhaps the first prank to be filmed, Watering the Gardener, and Train Coming Into the Station. Legend has it that the first audiences seeing Train arriving at a station did not understand what they were watching and feared that an actual train was coming right at them. Some fled the theater. Whether the story is true or apocryphal, as Jimmy Stewart's character Rance Stoddard says in John Ford's magnificent western The Man Who Shot Liberty Balance, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. This point in film history is often referred to as the cinema of attractions, so-called because of the novelty of moving images, it was enough to pique the curiosity of the public, and also because the subjects of movies, at least in the vein of Edison, constituted spectacles. Movies in the cinema of attractions era which is the first stage of movies, consisted of a single camera setup and a single shot that recorded one continuous action. There were minimal edits or cuts, and staging and scenery was limited as well. The second stage of movies is called a series of tableau shots. This age might also be called the era of the one reeler. One reel movies were about 10 minutes in duration and generally consisted of a series of static shots linking one or a continuous series of actions. A live narrator would provide expository information, as it could be difficult to tell, oftentimes, simply from the images, what the story was that unfolded on the screen. George Méliès was a French magician turned filmmaker who made some of the most spectacular one-reel films in the early 1900s. His most famous films, The Astronomer's Dream, in which a, an astronomer falls asleep and dreams that the moon comes down to Earth and eats him, uh, and A Trip to the Moon, in which a crew of intrepid astronauts embark on a voyage to the moon, only to do battle with some fierce creatures, are some of the earliest films to introduce special effects. These would be the equivalent to the Star Wars of its era. Edwin S. Porter was an American filmmaker who also worked in the Tableau era and made some of the most important one real American films, like The Life of an American Fireman and The Great Train Robbery. Many cite Porter as the first filmmaker to use a cut-in, that is, to interrupt the full shot with a close-up. And he was also the first to use an elliptical cut, that is, a cut that interrupts the chronological flow of narrative events to go back in time and follow a different plot line. Such techniques are commonplace in films today, but in the early 1900s, these strategies marked a radical departure with the techniques observed in the cinema of attraction stage. By 1915, film had entered its third stage of development, the full-length feature film. And by this time, filmmakers had begun ex experimenting with analytical editing, cross-cutting, and parallel editing. All common techniques filmmakers employ today, but at the time, marked a move towards greater cinematic sophistication. The fourth and final stage of film development was the continuity system, that was firmly established in Hollywood by 1930, and though the sound tra transition proved a temporary setback, was reinstated in full force by the mid-1930s. The audience for these early movies consisted predominantly of pe people in the United States' largest cities like New York City, Boston, and Chicago, cities where it's estimated that between 71 and 76 percent of the population were immigrants. During this time, viewers watched movies in Nickelodeon theaters, so named because it cost a nickel for admission. By 1907, cities and states had established censorship boards, where officials enforced censorship of movies. From the earliest days of the movies, conservative groups were eager con to control filmic depictions as a way of asserting social and political control over immigrant working class populations, whom in their own rhetoric they referred to as impressionable and ignorant. Of course, such posturing can also be read as a savvy maneuver to gain political and social power by oppressing the leisure time activities and freedom of speech granted to groups deemed as other. A National Board of Censorship was established and eventually changed its name to the National Board of Review because review sounded less pejorative and brought less baggage to the table than the word censorship. The 1915 Mutual Supreme Court case was pivotal 
in shaping the public's perception of movies and instrumental in legislating the direction Hollywood would take towards film censorship. The judges ruled that movies were not protected by the First Amendment and therefore not granted freedom of speech. Because movies were viewed as mere entertainment rather than art, one judge cited that movies can, quote, be used for evil and warned readers to beware of, quote, the insidious power of amusement. So much for settling gambling debts and photographing nude women in motion. D.W. Griffith is our next major figure in the development of silent cinema. Griffith produced, directed, and edited over 450 movies between 1908 and 1913. He developed a variety of shots within a scene that challenged the full shot, what we would call today the long shot, of the tableau stage of silent filmmaking. That is to say that Griffith is a key figure who gave filmmakers a template for analytical editing, which involves breaking down a scene into a variety of shots, ranging from the long shot to the close-up, and shifting points of view for dramatic and emotional emphasis of narrative material. Many consider Griffith the creator of the continuity editing system that exists to this day. He's also the first filmmaker to consistently use tinted or colored film stock to signal indoors versus outdoors, day and night, or for atmosphere and tone. He was also the first director to have actors rehearse a scene before shooting. Many film historians consider Griffiths the birth of the nation, the first modern narrative film. In terms of cinematic style, it was the template for the Hollywood film. Its $110,000 budget made the film the most extravagantly produced movie of its day, and it boasted a 16-week shooting schedule when the industry standard was one week. Commercially speaking, the film was a huge success. It earned over $3.5 million at the box office. Upon seeing the film, President Woodrow Wilson said it's like writing history with lightning. The film also inspired a storm of controversy at its blatantly racist depictions of African Americans that are honestly painful to watch. The NAACP attempted unsuccessfully to have the film banned, while the KKK used the film to launch a recruiting campaign that ultimately convinced millions to join their group. Griffith's response to the controversy was that he defended his film, saying he attempted to depict the race issue with more nuance by crafting both good and bad white characters as well as good and bad black characters. Of course, the easy rebuttal to this line of reasoning is that by, quote, good black characters, Griffith means African Americans who know their place and are content with the system of slavery in the antebellum South. Griffith also seemed utterly tone deaf to the notion that depicting miscegenation, that is, interracial marriage, as, quote, a fate worse than death, quote, yes, that's actually stated in the film, is a racist belief. Griffith's apology for Birth of the Nation was his next film, Intolerance, a four-hour epic that traces four narrative lines throughout history from ancient Babylonia to the present day, showing how humanity has been intolerant through the ages. The $400,000 film failed to connect with audience and was a financial failure. Griffith then cut the film without making a copy and turned it into two shorter films and in doing so lost about an hour of the original. While the film fared poorly in the United States, a copy found its way into the Soviet Union, and it became the textbook for Soviet montage, a key film movement of the 1920s. So although it was a commercial failure upon its release, Intolerance proved an artistically influential film, and in retrospect, I believe is a superior film to Birth of a Nation. Griffith's uh, film Broken Blossoms would go on to inspire another key film movement of the 1920s, German Expressionism. Thus, three of the most significant industries in the 1920s, Hollywood, the Soviet industry, and the German, were all inspired by Griffith's silent epic films. This is Professor Pontificate signing off until next time. In the meanwhile, do not bother me with your question as I am too busy engaged with the life of the mind. Instead, consult your course instructor, Professor Matt, a most kind and benevolent man. I bid you good day.